Chapter Seventeen of A Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Winter at Los Palomas. The winter succeeding the drought was an unusually mild one, frost and sleet being unseen at Los Palomas. After the holidays, several warm rains fell, affording fine hunting and assuring enough moisture in the soil to ensure an early spring. The preceding winter had been gloomy, but this proved to be the most social one since my advent, for within fifty miles of the ranch no less than two weddings occurred during Christmas week. As to little neighborhood happenings, we could hear of half a dozen every time we went to Shepherd's after the mail. When the native help of the ranch was started at blocking out the stone for the chapel, Uncle Lance took the hounds and with two of the boys went down to Wilson's ranch for a hunt. Gallup went, of course, but just why he took scales along, unless with the design of making a match between one of the younger daughters of this neighboring ranchman and the Marylander, was not entirely clear. When he wanted to, Scales could make himself very agreeable, and had it not been for his profligate disposition, his being taken along on the hunt would have been no mystery. Everyone on the ranch, including the master and mistress, were cognizant of the fact that for the past year he had maintained a correspondence with a girl in Florida, the one whose letter and photograph had been found in the box of oranges. He hardly deserved the confidence of that roguish girl, for he showed her letters to anyone who cared to read them. I had read every line of the whole correspondence, and it was plain that Scales had deceived the girl into believing that he was a prominent ranchman, when, in reality, the best that could be said of him was that he was a lovable vagabond. From the last letter, it was clear that he had promised to marry the girl during the Christmas week just past, but had asked for a postponement on the ground that the drought had prevented him from selling his beeves. When Uncle Lance made the discovery, during a cow hunt the fall before, of the correspondence between Scales and the Florida girl, he said to us around the campfire that night, Well, all I've got to say is that girl down in Florida is hard up. Why, it's entirely contrary to a girl's nature to want to be wooed by letter. Until the leopard changes his spots, the good old way of putting your arm around the girl and whispering that you love her will continue to be popular. If I was to hazard an opinion about that girl, Aaron, I'd say that she was ambitious to rise above her surroundings. The chances are that she wants to get away from home, and possibly She's as much displeased with the young men in the orange country as I sometimes get with you dot-rotted cowhands. Now, I'm not one of those people who's always harping about the youth of his day and generations being so much better than the present. That's all humbug. But what does get me is that you youngsters don't profit more by the experience of an old man like me who's been married three times. Line upon line and precept upon precept, I have preached this thing to my boys for the last ten years, and what has it amounted to? Not a single white bride has ever been brought to Las Palomas. They can call me a matchmaker if they want to, but the evidence is to the contrary. This was on the night after we passed Shepherd's, where Scales had received a letter from the Florida girl but why he should accompany the hunt now to Rimanera, unless the old ranchero proposed reforming him, was too deep a problem for me. On leaving for Wilson's, there was the usual bustle, hounds responding to the horn and horses under saddle champing their bits. I had hoped that permission to go over to the Frio and San Miguel would be given John and myself, but my employer's mind was too absorbed in something else and we were overlooked in the hurry to get away. Since the quarrying of the rock had commenced, my work had been overseeing the native help, of which we had some fifteen cutting and hauling, 
In numerous places within a mile of the headquarters, a soft porous rock cropped out. By using a crowbar with a tempered chisel point, the Mexicans easily channeled the rock into blocks, eighteen by thirty inches, splitting each stone a foot in thickness, so that when hauled to the place of use, each piece was ready to lay up in the wall. The ranch house at headquarters was built out of this rock, and where permanency was required, it was the best material available, whitening and apparently becoming firmer with time and exposure. I had not seen my sweetheart in nearly a month, but there I was, chained to a rock quarry and mule teams. The very idea of gallop and the prolific scales, riding the hounds and basking in the society of charming girls, nettled me. The remainder of the ranch outfit was under Deweese, building the new corrals, so that I never heard my own tongue spoken except at meals and about the house. My orders included the cutting of a few hundred rock extra above the needs of the chapel, and when this got noised among the help, I had to explain that there was some talk of building a stone cottage, and intimated that it was for Joanna and Fidel. But that lucky rascal was one of the crew cutting rock, and from some source or other he had learned that I was liable to deed a cottage at Las Palomas in the near future. The fact that I was acting segundo over the quarrying outfit was taken advantage of by Fidel to clear his skirts and charge the extra rock to my matrimonial expectations. He was a fast workman, and on every stone he split from the mother ledge he sang out, Otro Pedra por Don Thomas, and within a few minutes' time someone else would cry out, Otro Silar por Fidel Iwana, or Otro Pedra por Padre Norquin. A week passed, and there was no return of the hunters. We had so systemized our work at the quarry that my presence was hardly needed, so every evening I urged Cotton to sound the mistress for permission to visit our sweethearts. John was a good-natured fellow who could be easily led or pushed forward, and I had come to look upon Miss Jean as a ready supporter of any of her brother's projects. For that reason her permission was as good as the master's. But she parried all Cotton's hints, pleading the neglect of our work in the absence of her brother. I was disgusted with the monotony of quarry work, and likewise was John over building corrals as no cowhand ever enthuses over manual labor, when an incident occurred which afforded the opportunity desired. The mistress needed some small articles from the store at Shepherd's, and a Mexican boy had been sent down on this errand, and also to get the mail of the past two weeks. On the boy's return, he brought a message from the merchant, saying that Henry Anir had been accidentally killed by a horse that day and that the burial would take place at ten o'clock the next morning. The news threw the mistress of Las Palomas into a flutter. Her brother was absent, and she felt a delicacy in consulting the Weiss, and very naturally turned to me for advice. Funerals in the Nueces Valley were so very rare that I advised going, even if the unfortunate man had stood not too high in our estimation. Anir lived on the divide between Shepherds and the Frio at a ranch called Las Norias. As this ranch was not over ten miles from the mouth of the San Miguel, the astute mind can readily see the gleam of my axe in attending. Funerals were such events that I knew to a certainty that all the countryside within reach would attend, and the Vox Ranch was not over fifteen miles distance from Las Norias. Acting on my advice, the mistress ordered the ambulance to be ready to start by three o'clock the next morning, and gave everyone on the ranch who cared permission to go along. All of us took advantage of the offer, except Deweese, who, when out of hearing of the mistress, excused himself rather profanely. The boy had returned late in the day, but we lost no time in acting on Miss Jean's orders. Fortunately, the ambulance teams were in hand hauling rock, but we rushed out several vaqueros to bring in the remuda 
which contained our best saddle horses. It was after dark when they returned with the mounts wanted, and warning Trebucio that we would call him at an early hour, everyone retired for a few hours' rest. I would resent the charge that I am selfish or unsympathetic, yet before falling asleep that night, the deplorable accident was entirely overlooked in the anticipated pleasure of seeing Esther. As it was fully a thirty-five-mile drive, we started at daybreak, and to encourage the mules, Quail and Happersat rode in the lead until sun-up, when they dropped to the rear with Cotton and myself. We did not go by way of Shepherd's, but crossed the river several miles above the ferry, following an old cotton road made during the war, from the interior of the state to Matamoros, Mexico. It was some times before the hour named for the burial when we sighted Las Norias on the divide, and spurred up the ambulance team to reach the ranch in time for the funeral. The services were conducted by a strange minister who happened to be visiting in Oakville, but what impressed me in particular was the solicitude of Miss Jean for the widow. She had been frequently entertained at Las Palomas by its mistress, as the sweetheart of June DeWeese. Though since her marriage to Anir, a decided coolness had existed between the two women. But in the present hour of trouble, the past was forgotten, and they mingled their tears like sisters. On our return, which was to be by way of the Voxes, I joined those from the McLeod Ranch, while Happersat and Cotton accompanied the ambulance to the Vox home. Nearly every one going our way was on horseback, and when the cavalcade was some distance from Las Dorias, my sweetheart dropped to the rear for a confidential chat and told me that a lawyer from Corpus Christi, an old friend of the family, had come up for the purpose of taking the preliminary steps for securing her freedom, and that she expected to be relieved of the odious ties which bound her to Oxenford at the May term of the court. This was pleasant news to me, for there would be no reason for delaying our marriage. Happersat rode down to the San Miguel the next morning to inform Quayle and myself that the mistress was then on the way to spend the night with the widow Anir, and that the rest of us were to report at home the following evening. She had apparently inspected the lines on the Frio, and finding everything favorable, turned to other fields. I was disappointed, for Esther and I had planned to go up to the Vox Ranch during the visit. Dan suggested that we ride home together by way of the Voxes, but Quail bitterly refused even to go near the ranch. He felt very sore and revengeful over being jilted by Frances after she had let him crown her queen of the ball at the tournament dance. So, agreeing to meet on the divide the next day, for the ride back to Las Palomas, we parted. The next afternoon, on reaching the divide between the Frio and the home river, Theodore and I scanned the horizon in vain for any horsemen. We dismounted, and after waiting nearly an hour, descried two specks to the northward, which we knew must be our men. On coming up, they also threw themselves on the ground, and we indulged in a cigarette while we compared notes. I had nothing to conceal, and frankly confessed that Esther and I expected to marry during the latter part of May. Cotton, though, seemed reticent, and though Theodore cross-questioned him rather severely, was non-committal and dumb as an oyster. But before we recrossed the Nueces that evening, John and I, having fallen far to the rear of the other two, he admitted to me that his wedding would occur within a month after Lent. It was to be a confidence between us, but I advised him to take Uncle Lance into the secret at once. But on reaching the ranch we learned that the hunting party had not returned, nor had the mistress. The next morning we resumed our work, Quail and Cotton at Corral Building and I at Rock Quarry. The work had progressed during my absence, and the number of pieces desired was nearing completion and with but a one team hauling the workshop was already congested with cut building stone. By noon the quarry was so 
cluttered with blocks, that I ordered half the help to take axes and go up to the Ensignal to cut dry oak wood for burning the lime. With the remainder of my outfit, we cleaned out and sealed off the walls of an old lime kiln, which had served ever since the first rock building rose on Las Palomas. The oven was cut in the same porous formation, the interior resembling an immense jug, possibly twelve feet in diameter and fifteen feet in height to the surface of the ledge. By locating the kiln near the abrupt wall of an abandoned quarry, ventilation was given from below by a connecting tunnel some twenty feet in length. Layers of wood and limestone were placed within until the interior was filled. When it was fired, and after burning for a few hours, the draft was cut off below and above, and the heat retained until the limestone was properly burned. Near the middle of the afternoon, the drivers hauling the blocks drove near the kiln and shouted that the hunters had returned. Scaling off the burnt rock in the interior and removing the debris made it late before our job was finished. Then one of the vaqueros working on the outside told us that the ambulance had crossed the river over an hour before and was then in the ranch. This was good news, and mounting our horses, we galloped into the headquarters and found the corral outfit already there. Miss Jean soon had our segundo, an unwilling prisoner, in a corner, and from his impatient manner and her low tones it was plain to be seen that her two days' visit with Mrs. Anir had resulted in some word for DeWeese. Not wishing to intrude, I avoided them in search of my employer, finding him in Gallup at an outhouse holding a hound while Scales was taking a few stitches in an ugly cut which the dog had received from a javelina. Paying no attention to the two boys, I gave him the news and bluntly informed him that Esther and I expected to marry in May. "'Bully for you, Tom,' said he. "'Hold this forefoot, and look out he don't bite you. So she'll get her divorce at the bay term, and then all outdoors can't stand in your way the next time. Now that means you'll have to get out fully two hundred more of those building rock, for your cottage will need three rooms. Take another stitch, not your thread well, and be quick about it. I tell you the javelina were pretty fierce. This is the fifth dog we've doctored since we returned. On freeing the poor hound, we both looked the pack over carefully, and as no others needed attention, Aaron and Glenn were excused. No sooner were they out of hearing than I suggested that the order be made for five hundred stone, as no doubt John Cotton would also need a cottage shortly after Lent. The old matchmaker beamed with smiles. Is that right, Tom? he inquired. Of course, you boys tell each other what you would hardly tell me. And so they have made the riffle at last. Why, of course they shall have a cottage. And it will be so near that I can hear the baby when it cries. Bully for tow-headed John. Oh, I reckon Las Palomas is coming to the front this year. Three new cottages and three new brides is not to be sneezed at. Does your mistress know all this good news? I informed him that I had not seen Miss Jean to speak to since the funeral, and that Cotton wished his intentions kept a secret. Of course, he said, that's just like a sap-headed youth, as if getting married was anything to be ashamed of. Why, when I was the age of you boys, I'd have felt proud over the fact. Once it kept a secret, does he? Well, I'll tell everybody I meet, and I'll send word to the ferry and to every ranch within a hundred miles that our John Cotton and Frank Vox are going to get married in the spring. There's nothing disgraceful in matrimony, and I'll publish this so wide that neither of them will dare back out. I've had my eye on that girl for years, and now... When there's a prospect of her becoming the wife of one of my boys, he wants it kept a secret. Well, I don't think it'll keep. After that I felt more comfortable over my confession. Before we were called to supper, everyone in the house 
including the Mexicans about headquarters, knew that Cotton and I were soon to be married. And all during the evening the same subject was revived at every lull in the conversation, though Deweese kept constantly intruding the corral building and making inquiries after the hunt. "'What difference does it make if we hunt it or not?' replied Uncle Lance to his foreman with some little feeling. Suppose we did hunt every third or fourth day. Those Wilson folk have a way of entertaining friends which makes riding after hounds seem commonplace. Why, the girls had Glenn and Aaron on the ground until old man Nate and myself could hardly get them out on a hunt at all. And when they did, provided the girls were along, they managed to get separated, and along about dusk they'd come slouching in by pairs, looking as innocent as turtle doves. Not that those Wilson girls can't ride, for I never saw a better horsewoman than Susie, the one who took such a shine to scales. I noticed Miss Jean cast a reproving glance at her brother on his connecting the name of Susie Wilson with that of his vagabond employee. The mistress was a Puritan in morals. That scales fell far below her ideal, there was no doubt and that the brother knew, too, well not to differ with her on this subject. When all the boys had retired except Cotton and me, the brother and sister became frank with each other. "'Well, now, you must not blame me if Miss Susie was attentive to Aaron,' said the old matchmaker, in conciliation, pacing the room. "'He was from Las Palomas, and their guest, and I see no harm in the girls being courteous and polite. Susie was just as nice as pie to me, and I hope you don't think I don't entertain the highest regard for Nate Wilson's family. Suppose one of the girls did smile a little too much on Aaron, was that my fault? Now, mind you, I never said a word one way or the other, but I'll bet every cow on Las Palomas that Aaron Scales, vagabond that he is, can get Susie Wilson for the asking. I know your standard of morals, but you must make allowance for others who look upon things differently from you and me. You remember Catherine Vetter, who married Carrie Troop at the close of the war? There's a similar case for you. Catherine married Troop just because he was so wicked, and at least that was the reason she gave, and she and you were old run-togethers. And you remember, too, that getting married was the turning point in Carrie Troop's life. Who knows but Aaron might sober down if he was to marry. Just because a man has sown a few wild oats in his youth, does that condemn him for all time? You want to be more liberal. Give me the man who has stood the fire tests of life in preference to the one who's never been tempted. Now, Lance, you know that you had a motive in taking Aaron down to the Wilsons, said the sister reprovingly. Don't get the idea that I can't read you like an open book. Your argument is as good as an admission of your object in going to Ramanera. Ever since Scales got that flirtation with Susie Vox last summer, it was easy to see that Aaron was a favorite with you. Why don't you take Habersat around and introduce him to some nice girls? Honest, Lance, I wouldn't give poor old Dan for the big beef corral full of rascals like Scales. Look at how he trifled with that silly girl in Florida. Instead of continuing the argument, the wily ranchero changed the subject. The trouble with Dan is he's too old. When a fellow begins to get a little gray around the edges, he gets so foxy that you couldn't bait him into a matrimonial trap with sweet grapes. But, sis, what's the matter with your keeping an eye open for a girl for Dan, if he's such a favorite with you? If I had half the interest in him that you profess, I certainly wouldn't ask anyone to help. It wouldn't surprise me if the boys take to marrying freely after John and Tom bring their brides to Las Palomas. Now that Mrs. Anir is a widow, there's the same old chance for June. If Glenn doesn't make the riffle with Miss June, he ought to be shot on general principles. And I don't know, little sister, if you and I were both to oppose it, that we could prevent that rascal of an Aaron 
for marrying into the Wilson family. You have no idea what a case Susie and Scales scared up during our ten days' hunt. That only leaves Dan and Theodore. But what's the use of counting the chicken so soon? You go to bed, for I'm going to send to the mission tomorrow after the Masons. There's no use in my turning in, for I won't sleep a wink tonight thinking all this over. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Indian Scare. Near the close of January seventy nine, the Nueces Valley was stirred by an Indian scare. I had a distinct recollection of two similar scares in my boyhood on the San Antonio River, in which I never caught a glimpse of the noble red man. But whether the rumors were groundless or not, Las Palomas set her house in order. The worst thing we had to fear was the loss of our saddle stock, as they were gentle and could be easily run off and corralled on the range by stretching lariats. At this time the ranch had some ten remudas, including nearly five hundred saddle horses, some of them ranging ten or fifteen miles from the ranch. And on receipt of the first rumor, every remuda was brought in home and put under a general herd, night and day. These Indian scares, said Uncle Lance, are just about as regular as droughts. When I first settled here, the Indians hunted up and down this valley every few years, but they never molested anything. Why, I got well acquainted with several bucks and used to swap rawhide with them for buckskin. Game was so abundant that there was no temptation to kill cattle or steal horses. But the rascals seemed to be getting worse ever since. The last scare was just ten years ago next month and kept us all guessing. The renegades were kickapoos and came down the Frio from out west. One Sunday morning they surprised two of Wall's vaqueros while the latter were dressing a wild hog which they had killed. The Mexicans had only one horse and one gun between them. One of them took the horse and the other took the carbine. Not daring to follow the one with the gun for fear of ambuscade, the Indians gave chase to the vaquero on horseback whom they easily captured. After stripping him of all his clothing, they tied his hands with thongs and pinned the poor devil to a tree with spear thrust through the back. The other Mexican made his escape in the chaparral and got back to the ranch. As it happened, there was only a man or two at Waugh's place at the time, and no attempt was made to follow the Indians, who, after killing the vaquero, went on west to Altita Creek, the one which puts in the Nueces from the north, just about twenty miles above the Ganso. Wall had a sheep camp on the head of the Altito, and there the Kickapoos killed two of his pastors and robbed the camp. From that creek on westward, their course was marked with murders and horse-stealing, but the country was so sparsely settled that little or no resistance could be offered and the redskins escaped without punishment. At that time, they were armed with bow and arrow and spears. But I have it on good authority that all these western tribes now have firearms. The very name of Indian scares women and children. And if they should come down this river, we must keep in the open and avoid ambush, as that is an Indian forte. All the women and children at the outlying ranchitas were brought into headquarters, the men being left to look after the houses and their stock and flocks. In the interim, Father Norquin and the Masons had arrived, and the chapel was daily taking shape. But the rumors of the Indian raid thickened. Reports came in of shepherds shot with their flocks over near Espanato Lake and along the Leona River, and Las Palomas took on an air of an armed camp. Though we never ceased to ride the range whenever duty called, we went always in squads of four or five. The first abatement 
of the scare took place when one evening a cavalcade of Texas Rangers reached our ranch from DeWitt County. They consisted of fifteen mounted men under Lieutenant Frank Barr, with a commissary of four pack mules. The detachment was from one of the crack companies of the state, and had with them several half-blooded trailers, though every man in the squad was more or less an expert in that line. They were traveling light, and had covered over a hundred miles during the day and a half preceding their arrival at headquarters. The hospitality of Las Palomas was theirs to command, and as their most urgent need was mounts, they were made welcome to the pick of every horse under herd. Sunrise saw our ranger guests on their way, leaving the high tension relaxed and everyone on the ranch breathing easier. But the Indian scare did not prove an ill wind to the plans of Father Norquin. With the concentration of the people from the ranchitas and those belonging at the home ranch, the chapel building went on by leaps and bounds. A native carpenter had been secured from Santa Maria, and the enthusiastic padre, laying aside his vestments, worked with his hands as a common laborer. The energy with which he inspired the natives made him a valuable overseer. From assisting the carpenter in hewing the rafters, to advising the masons in laying a keystone, or with his own hands, mixing the mortar and tamping the earth to give firm foundation to the cement floor, he was the directing spirit. Very little lumber was used in the construction of buildings at Las Palomas. The houses were thatched with a coarse salt grass, called by the natives Sacoista. Every year in the overflowed portions of the valley, great quantities of this material were cut by the native help and stored against its need. The grass sometimes grew two feet in height and at cutting was wrapped tightly and tied in hands about two inches in diameter. For fastening to the roofing lathe, green blades of the Spanish dagger were used which, after being roasted over a fire to toughen the fiber, were split into thongs and bound the hands securely in a solid mass, layer upon layer like shingles. Crude as it may appear, this was a most serviceable roof, being both rainproof and impervious to heat, while owing to its compactness a live coal of fire laid upon it would smolder but not ignite. No sooner had the masons finished the plastering of the interior walls and cementing the floor than they began on a two-roomed cottage. As its white walls arose, conjecture was rife as to who was to occupy it. I made no bones of the fact that I expected to occupy a wakal in the near future, but denied that this was to be mine, as I had been promised one with three rooms. Out of hearing of our employer, John Cotton also religiously denied that the tiny house was for his use. Fidel, however, took the chafing without a denial, the padre and Uncle Lance being his two worst tormentors. During the previous visit of the padre, when the chapel was decided on, the order for the finishing materials for the building had been placed with a merchant at Shepherd's, and was brought up from Corpus Christi through his freighters. We now had notice from the merchant that his teamsters had returned and two four-mule teams went down to the ferry for the lumber, glassware, sashes, and doors. Miss Jean had been importuning the Padre daily to know when the dedication would take place, as she was planning to invite the countryside. "'Ah, my daughter,' replied the priest, "'we must learn to cultivate patience. All things that abide are of slow but steady growth, and my work is for eternity.' Therefore I must be an earnest servant, so that when my life's duty ends, it can be said in truth, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But I am as anxious to consecrate this building to the master's service as any one. My good woman, if I only had a few parishioners like you, we would work wonders among these natives. On the return of the mule teams, the completion of the building could be determined 
and the Padre announced the 21st of February as the date of dedication. On reaching this decision, the ranch was set in order for an occasion of more than ordinary moment. Fidel and Juana were impatient to be married, and the master and mistress had decided that the ceremony should be performed the day after the dedication, and all the guests of the ranch should remain for the festivities. The padre, still in command, dispatched the vaquero to the mission, announcing the completion of the chapel and asking for a brother priest to bring out certain vestments and assist in the dedicatory exercises. The Indian scare was subsiding, and as no word had come from the rangers, confidence grew that the worst was over. So we scattered in every direction inviting guests, from the booths on the Frio to the Wilsons of Ramonera, and along the home river as far as Lagarto. Our friends were bidden in the name of the master and mistress of Las Palomas. On my return from taking the invitations to the ranches north, the chapel was just receiving the finishing touches. The cross, crowning the front, glistened in fresh paint, while on the interior walls shone cheap lithographs of the Madonna and Christ. The old padre, proud and jealous as a bridegroom over his bride, directed the young friar here and there, himself standing aloof and studying with an artist's eye every effect in color and drapery. The only discordant note in the interior was the rough benches, in the building of which Father Norquin himself had worked, thus following, as he repeatedly admonished us, in the footsteps of his master, the carpenter of Galilee. The ceremony of dedication was to be followed by a mass at high noon. Don Mateo Gonzalez of Santa Maria sent his regrets, as did likewise Don Alejandro Trevino of the mission. But the other invited guests came early and stayed late. The women and children of the outlying ranchitas had not yet returned to their homes, and with our invited guests made an assembly of nearly a hundred and fifty persons. Unexpectedly, and within two hours of the appointed time for the service to commence, a cavalcade was sighted approaching the ranch from the west. As they turned in towards headquarters, someone recognized the horses, and a shout of welcome greeted our ranger guests of over two weeks before. Uncle Lance met them as if they had been expected, and invited the lieutenant and his men to dismount and remain a few days as guests of Las Palomas. When they urged the importance of continuing on their journey to report to the governor, the host replied, Lieutenant Barr, that don't go here. Fall out of your saddles and borrow all the razors and white shirts on the ranch, for we need you for the dedication of the chapel today and for a wedding and infare for tomorrow. We don't see you along this river as often as we'd like to, and when you do happen along in time for his peaceful duty, you can't get away so easily. If you had any special report to make to your superiors, why, write her out, and I'll send a vaquero with it to Oakville this afternoon, and it'll go north on the stage tomorrow. But, Lieutenant, you mustn't think you can ride right past Las Palomas when you're not under emergency orders. Now, fall off those horses and spruce up a little, for I intend to introduce you to some as nice girls as you ever met. You may want to quit rangering some day, and I may need a man about your size, and I'm getting tired of single ones. Lieutenant Barr surrendered. Saddles were stripped from horses, packs were unlashed from mules, and every animal was sent to our remudas under herd. The accoutrements were stacked inside the gate like haycocks. With slickers thrown over them, the carbines were thrown on the gallery, and from every nail, peg, or hook on the wall, belts and six-shooters hung in groups. These rangers were just ordinary-looking men, and they might have been mistaken for an outfit of cowhands. In age they ranged from a smiling youth of twenty to grizzled men of forty. Yet in every countenance was written a resolute determination. All the razors of the ranch 
were brought into immediate use, while every presentable shirt, collar, and tie in the house was unearthed and placed at their disposal. While arranging hasty toilets, the men informed us that when they reached Esposanto's Lake, the Redskins had left, and that they had trailed them south until the Indians had crossed the Rio Grande into Mexico, several days in advance of their arrival. The usual number of isolated sheep herders killed and of horses stolen were the features of that raid. The guests had been arriving all morning. The booths had reached the ranch the night before, and the last to put in an appearance was the contingent from the Frio and San Miguel. Before the appearance of the rangers, they had been sighted across the river, and they rode up with Pierre Vaux like a captain of the old guard in the lead. Ah, Don Lance, he cried, what you think? They say Don Pierre no rides fast going to church. These youngsters laugh all the time and say I never get here unless the dogs is along. Sacre! At all times, like I was old man hombre. Keep away from this horse, he allow, nobody but me to lay one hand on him. Keep away, I told you. I helped the girls to dismount, Miss Jean kissing them right and left and bustling them off into the house to tidy up as fast as possible, for the hour was almost at hand. On catching sight of Mrs. Anir, fresh and charming in her widow's weeds, Uncle Lance brushed Don Pierre aside and cordially greeted her. Vaqueros took the horses, and as I strolled up the pathway with Esther, I noticed an upper window full of ranger faces peering down on the girls. Before this last contingent had had time to spruce up, Pasquale's eldest boy rode around all the wakals, ringing a small handbell to summon the population to the dedication. Outside of our home crowd, we had forty white guests, not including the two booth children and the priests. As fast as the rangers were made presentable, the masters and mistress introduced them to all the girls present. Of course, there were a few who could not be enticed near a woman, but Quail and Happersat, like kindred spirits, took the backward ones under their wing, and the procession started for the chapel. The audience was typical of the Texas frontier at the close of the seventies. Two priests of European birth conducted the services. Pioneer cowmen of various nationalities and their families intermingled and occupied central seats. By the side of his host, a veteran of thirty-six, when Mexican rule was driven from the land, sat Lieutenant Barr, then engaged in accomplishing a second redemption of the state from crime and lawlessness. Lovable and esteemed men were present, who had followed the fortunes of war until the southern flag, to which they had rallied, went down in defeat. The younger generation of men were stalwart in physique, while the girls were modest in their rustic beauty. Sitting on the cement floor on three sides of us were the natives of the ranch, civilized, but with little improvement over their Aztec ancestors. The dedicatory exercises were brief and simple. Everyone was invited to remain for the celebration of the first mass in the newly consecrated building. Many who were not communicants accepted, but noticing the mistress and my sweetheart taking their leave, I joined them and assisted in arranging the tables so that all our guests could be seated at two sittings. At the conclusion of the service, dinner was waiting, and Father Norquin and Mr. Nate Wilson were asked to carve at one table, while the young friar and Lieutenant Barr, in a similar capacity, officiated at the other. There was so much volunteer help in the kitchen that I was soon excused and joined the younger people on the gallery. As to whom Cotton and Gallup were monopolizing, there was no doubt, but I had a curiosity to notice what scales would do when placed between two fires. But not for nothing had he cultivated the acquaintance of a sandy-mustached young ranger who was at that moment entertaining Susanna Vox in an alcove 
at the farther end of the veranda. Aaron, when returning from the chapel with Susie Wilson, had succeeded in getting no nearer the house than a clump of oak trees which sheltered an old rustic settee. And when the young folks were called into dinner, the vagabond Scales and Miss Wilson of Ramanera had to be called the second time. In seating the younger generation, Miss Jean showed her finesses. Nearly all the rangers had dined at the first table, but the widow Anir waited for the second one. Why, only a privileged few of us could guess. Artfully, and with seeming unconsciousness on the part of every one, Deweese was placed beside the charming widow, though I had a suspicion that June was the only innocent party in the company. Captain Byler and I were carving at the same table, at which our foreman and the widow were seated, and, being in the secret, I noted step by step the progress of the widow and the signs of gradual surrender of the Corporal Segundo. I had a distinct recollection of having once smashed some earnest resolves, and of having capitulated under similar circumstances. And now, being happily in love, I secretly wished success to little God Cupid in the case in hand. And all during that afternoon and evening, it was clearly apparent to anyone who cared to notice that success was very likely. The evening was a memorable one at Las Palomas. Never before, in my knowledge, had the ranch had so many and such amiable guests. The rangers took kindly to our hospitality, and Father Norquin waddled about, God blessing every one, old and young, frivolous and sedate. Owing to the nature of the services of the day, the evening was spent in conversation among the elders, while the younger element promenaded the spacious gallery or occupied alcoves, nooks, and corners about the grounds. On retiring for the night, the men yielded the house to the women guests, sleeping on the upper and lower verandas, while the ranger contingent, scorning beds or shelter, unrolled their blankets under the spreading live oaks in the yard. But the real interest centered in the marriage of Fidel and Joanna, which took place at six o'clock the following evening. Everyone, including the native element, repaired to the new chapel to attend the wedding. Uncle Lance and his sister had rivaled each other as to whether man or maid should have the better outfit. Fidel was physically far above the average of the natives, slightly bow-legged, stolid, and the coolest person in the church. The bride was in quite a flutter, but having been coached and rehearsed daily by her mistress, managed to get through the ordeal. The young priest performed the ceremony using his own native tongue, the rich silvery accents of Spanish. At the conclusion of the service, everyone congratulated the happy couple. The women and girls in tears, the sterner sex, without demonstration of feeling. When we were outside the chapel and waiting for our sweethearts to dry the tears and join us, Uncle Lance came swaggering over to John Cotton and me, and slapping us both on the back, said, "'Boys, that rascal of a Fidel had a splendid nerve. Did you notice how he faced the guns without a tremor, never batted an eye, but took his medicine like a little man?' I hope both of you boys will show equally good nerve when your turn comes. Why, I doubt if there was a ranger in the whole squad, unless it was that red-headed rascal who kissed the bride, who would have stood the test like that vaquero, without a shiver. And it's something you can't get used to. Now, as you all know, I've been married three times. The first two times I was as cool as most, but the third whirl... I trembled all over. Quavers ran through me, my tongue was palsied, my teeth chattered, my knees knocked together, and I felt like a man that was sent for and couldn't go. Now, mind you, it was the third time, and I was only forty-five. What a night that was! The contents of the warehouse had been shifted. Native musicians had come up from Santa Maria, and everyone about the home ranch 
who could strum a guitar, was pressed into service. The storeroom was given over to the natives, and after honoring the occasion with their presence as patrons, the master and mistress, after the opening dance, withdrew in company with their guests. The night had then barely commenced. Claiming two guitarists, we soon had our guests waltzing on the veranda, hall, and spacious dining room to the music of my fiddle. Several of the rangers could play, and by taking turns, everyone had a joyous time, including the two priests. Among the Mexicans, the dancing continued until daybreak. Shortly after midnight, our guests retired, and the next morning found all, including the priests, preparing to take their departure. As was customary, we rode a short distance with our guests, bidding them again to Las Palomas, and receiving similar invitations in return. With the exception of Captain Byler, the rangers were the last to take their leave. When the mules were packed and their mounts saddled, the old ranchero extended them a welcome whenever they came that way again. "'Well now, Mr. Lovelace,' said Lieutenant Barr, "'you had better not press that invitation too far. The good time we had with you discounts rangering for the state of Texas. Rest assured, sir, that we will not soon forget the hospitality of Las Palomas, nor its ability to entertain. Push on with the packs, boys, and I'll take leave of the mistress in behalf of you all, and overtake the squad before it reaches the river. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Horse Brands. Before gathering the fillies and mares that spring, and while riding the range, locating our horse stock, Pasquale brought in word late one evening that a Ladino stallion had killed the regular one, and was then in possession of the manada. The fight between the outlaw and the ranch stallion had evidently occurred above the mouth of the Gonzo, and several miles to the north of the home river, for he had accidentally found the carcass of the dead horse at a small lake, and, recognizing the animal by his color, had immediately scoured the country in search of the band. He had finally located the Manada, many miles off their range, but at sight of the Vaccaro, the Ladino usurper, had deserted the mares, halting, however, out of gunshot, yet following at a safe distance as Pasquale drifted them back. Leaving the Manada on their former range, Pasquale had ridden into the ranch and reported. It was then too late in the day to start against the interloper, as the range was fully twenty-five miles away, and we were delayed the next morning in getting up speedy saddle horses from distant and various remudas and did not get away from the ranch until after dinner. But then we started, taking the usual pack mules and provisioned for a week's outing. Included in the party was Captain Frank Byler, the regular home crowd, and three Mexicans. With an extra saddle horse for each, we rode away merrily to declare war on the Ladino stallion. This is the third time since I've been ranching here, said Uncle Lance to Captain Frank, as we rode along, that I've had stallions killed. There always has been bands of wild horses west here, between the Leona and Nueces River, and around Espanto Lake. Now that country is settling up. The people walk down the bands, and the small stallions escape, and in drifting about find our range. They're wily rascals and our old stallions don't stand any more show with them than a fat hog would with a javelina. That's why I take as much pride in killing one as I do a rattlesnake. We made camp early that evening on the home river opposite the range of the Manada, sending out Pasquale to locate the band and watch them until dark. Uncle Lance outlined his idea of circling the band and bagging the outlaw in the uncertain light of dawn. Pasquale reported on his return, after dark, that the manada 
were contentedly feeding on their accustomed range within three miles of camp. Pasquale had watched the band for an hour and described the Ladino stallion as a cinnamon-colored coyote, splendidly proportioned and unusually large for a mustang. Naturally, in expectation of the coming sport, the horses became the topic around the campfire that night. Every man present was a born horseman, and there was a generous rivalry for the honor in telling horse stories. Aaron Scales joined the group at a fortunate time to introduce an incident from his own experiences, and, raking out a coal of fire for his pipe, began. The first ranch I ever worked on, said he, was located on the Navidad in Lavaca County. It was quite a new country then, rather broken and timbered in places, and full of bear and wolves. Our outfit was working some cattle before the general round-up in the spring. We wanted to move one brand to another range as soon as the grass would permit, and we were gathering them for that purpose. We had some ninety saddle horses with us to do the work sufficient to mount fifteen men. One night we camped in a favorite spot, and as we had no cattle to hold that night, all the horses were thrown loose, with the usual precautions of hobbling, except two or three on picket. All but about ten head wore the bracelets, and those ten were pals, their partners wearing the hemp. Early in the evening, probably nine o'clock, with a bright fire burning, and the boys spreading down their beds for the night, suddenly the horses were heard running, and the next moment they hobbled into camp like a school of porpoises, trampling over the beds and crowding up to the fire and the wagon. They almost knocked down some of the boys, so sudden was their entrance. Then they set up a terrible nickering for mates. The boys went amongst them, and the horses that were timid and shy almost caressed their riders, trembling in limb and muscle, the while through fear like a leaf. We concluded a bear had scented the camp, and in approaching it had circled round and run amuck our saddle horses. Every horse by instinct is afraid of a bear, but more particularly a range raised one. It's the same instinct that makes it impossible to ride or drive a range raised horse over a rattlesnake. Well, after the boys had petted their mounts and quieted their fears, they were still reluctant to leave camp, but stood around for several hours, evidently feeling more secure in our presence. Now and then one of the free ones would graze out a little distance, cautiously sniff the air, then trot back to the others. We built up a big fire to scare away any bear or wolves that might be in the vicinity but the horses stayed like invited guests, perfectly contented as long as we would pet them and talk to them. Some of the boys crawled under the wagon, hoping to get a little sleep, rather than spread their beds where a horse could stampede over it. Near midnight we took ropes and saddle blankets and drove them several hundred yards from camp. The rest of the night we slept with one eye open, expecting every moment to hear them take fright and return. They didn't. But at daylight, every horse was within five hundred yards of the wagon, and when we unhobbled them and broke camp that morning, we had to throw riders in the lead to hold them back. On the conclusion of Scales' experience, there was no lack of volunteers to take up the thread, though an unwritten law forbade interruptions. Our employer was among the group, and out of deference to our guests, the boys remained silent. Uncle Lance finally regaled us with an account of a fight between range stallions, which he had once witnessed, and on its conclusion Theodore Quayle took his turn. The man I was working for, once, moved nearly a thousand head of mixed-range stock, of which about three hundred were young mules, from the San Saba to the Concho River. It was a dry country, and we were compelled to follow the McCavitt and Fort Chadbourne Trail. We had timed our drives so that we reached creeks once a day at least, sometimes oftener. 
It was the latter part of summer, and was unusually hot and drouthy. There was one drive of twenty-five miles ahead that the owner knew of without water, and we had planned this drive so as to reach it at noon, drive halfway, make a dry camp overnight, and reach the pools by noon the next day. Imagine our chagrin on reaching the watering place to find the stream dry. We lost several hours riding up and down the arroyo in hopes of finding relief for the men, if not for the stock. It had been dusty for weeks. The cook had a little water in his keg, but only enough for drinking purposes. It was twenty miles yet to the concho, and making it before night we must. Turning back was farther than going ahead, and the afternoon was fearfully hot. The heat waves looked like a sea of fire. The first part of the afternoon drive was a gradual ascent for fifteen miles, and then came a narrow plateau of a divide. As we reached this mesa, a sorrier-looking lot of men, horses, and mules can hardly be imagined. We had already traveled over forty miles without water for the stock, and five more lay between us and the coveted river. The heat was oppressive to the men, but the herd suffered most from the fine alkali dust which enveloped them. Their eyebrows and nostrils were whitened with this fine powder, while all colors merged into one. On reaching this divide, we could see the cottonwoods that outlined the stream ahead. Before we had fully crossed this watershed and begun the descent, the mules would trot along beside the riders in the lead, even permitting us to lay our hands on their back. It was getting late in the day before the first friendly breeze of the afternoon blew softly in our faces. Then, great Scott, what a change came over man and herd. The mules in front threw up their heads and broke into a grand chorus. Those that were strung out took up the refrain and trotted forward. The horses set up a rival concert in a higher key. They had scented the water five miles off. All hands except one man on each side now rode in the lead. Every once in a while some enthusiastic mule would break through the line of horsemen and would have to be brought back. Every time we came to an elevation where we could catch the breeze, the grand horse and mule concert would break out anew. At the last elevation between us and the water, several mules broke through, and before they could be brought back, the whole herd had broken into a run which was impossible to check. We opened out then and let them go. The concho was barely running, but had long deep pools here and there into which horses and mules plunged dropping down, rolled over, and then got up to nicker and bray. The young mules did everything but drink, while the horses were crazy with delight. When the wagon came up, we went into camp and left them to play out their hands. There was no hurting to do that night, as the water would hold them as readily as a hundred men. "'Well, I'm going to hunt my blankets,' said Uncle Lance, rising. "'You understand, Captain,' that you are to sleep with me tonight. Davy Crockett once said that the politest man he ever met in Washington simply set out the decanter and glasses and then walked over and looked out the window while he took a drink. Now I want to be equally polite and don't want to hurry you to sleep. But whenever you get tired of yarning, you'll find a bed with me in it to the windward of that live oak treetop over yonder. Captain Frank showed no inclination to accept the invitation, just then, but assured his host that he would join him later. An hour or two passed by. "'Haven't you fellows gone to bed yet?' came an inquiry from out of the fallen treetop, beyond the fire in a voice which we all recognized. "'All right, boys, sit up all night and tell fool stories if you want to, but remember—' I'll have the last rascal of you in the saddle an hour before daybreak. I have little sympathy for a man who won't sleep when he has a good chance. So if you don't turn in at all, it will be all right. But you'll be routed out at three in the morning, 
and the man who requires a second calling will get a bucket of water in his face. Captain Frank and several of us rose, expecting to take the hint of our employer, when our good intentions were arrested by a query from Dan Happersat. Did any of you ever walk down a wild horse? None of us had, and we turned back and reseated ourselves in the group. I had a little whirl of it once when I was a youngster, said Dan, except we didn't walk. It was well known that there were several bands of wild horses ranging in the southwest corner of Tom Green County. Those who had seen them described one band as numbering forty to fifty head with a fine chestnut stallion as a leader. Their range was well located when water was plentiful, but during certain months of the year the shallow lagoons where they watered dried up and they were compelled to leave. It was when they were forced to go to other waters that glimpses of them were to be had, and then only at a distance of one or two miles. There was an outfit made up one spring to go out to their range and walk these horses down. This season of the year was selected, as the lagoons would be full of water, and the horses would naturally be reduced in flesh and strength after the winter, as well as weak and thin-blooded from their first taste of grass. We took along two wagons, one loaded with grain for our mounts. These saddle horses had been eating grain for months before we started, and their flesh was firm and solid. We headed for the lagoons, which were known to a few of our party, and when we came within ten miles of the water holes, we saw fresh signs of a band, places where they had apparently grazed within a week. But it was the second day before we caught sight of the wild horses, and too late in the day to give them chase. They were watering at a large lake south of our camp, and we did not disturb them. We watched them until nightfall, and that night we planned to give them chase at daybreak. Four of us were to do the riding by turns, and imaginary stations were allotted to the four quarters of our camp. If they refused to leave their range and circled, we could send them at least a hundred and fifty miles the first day, ourselves riding possibly a hundred, and this riding would be divided among four horses, with plenty of fresh ones at camp for a change. Being the lightest rider in the party, it was decided that I was to give them the first chase. We had a crafty plainsman for our captain and long before daylight he and I rode out and waited for the first peep of day. Before the sun had risen, we sighted the wild herd within a mile of the place where darkness had settled over them the night previous. With a few parting instructions from our captain, I rode leisurely between them and the lake where they had watered the evening before. At first sight of me, they took fright and ran to a slight elevation. There they halted a moment, craning their necks and sniffing the air. This was my first fair view of the chestnut stallion. He refused to break into a gallop, and even stopped before the rest, turning defiantly on this intruder of his domain. From the course I was riding, every moment I was expecting them to catch the wind of me. Suddenly they scented me, knew me for an enemy, and with the stallion in the lead, they were off to the south. It was an exciting ride that morning. Without a halt, they ran twenty miles to the south and then turned to the left and there halted on an elevation. But a shot in the air told them that all was not well and they moved on. For an hour and a half they kept their course to the east and at last turned to the north. This was, as we had calculated, about their range. In another hour at the farthest, a new rider with a fresh horse would take up the running. My horse was still fresh and enjoying the chase when, on a swell of the plain, I made out the rider who was to relieve me, and though it was early yet in the day, the Mustangs had covered sixty miles to my forty. When I saw my relief locate the band, I turned and rode leisurely to camp. When the last two riders came into camp that night, they reported, having left the herd at a new lake, 
to which the Mustang had led them, some fifteen miles from our camp to the westward. Each day for the following week was a repetition of the first with varying incident, but each day it was plain to be seen that they were fagging fast. Toward the evening of the eighth day, the rider dared not crowd them for fear of their splitting into small bands, a thing to be avoided. On the ninth day, two riders took them at a time, pushing them unmercifully, but preventing them from splitting. And in the evening of this day, they could be turned at the will of the riders. It was then agreed that after a half-day's chase on the morrow, they could be handled with ease. By noon next day, we had driven them within a mile of our camp. They were tired out, and we turned them into an impromptu corral made of wagons and ropes, all but the chestnut stallion. At the last he escaped us. He stopped on a little knoll and took a farewell look at his band. There were four old United States cavalry horses among our captive band of mustangs, gray with age and worthless, no telling where they came from. We clamped a mule shoe over the pasterns of the younger horses, tied toggles to the others, and the next morning set out on a return to the settlements. Under his promise, the old ranchero had to camp a stir over an hour before dawn. Horses were brought in from picket ropes and divided into two squads. Pasquale leading off to the windward of where the band was located at dusk previous. The rest of the men followed Uncle Lance to complete the leeward side of the circle. The location of the Manada had been described as between a small hill covered with Spanish bayonet on one hand and a Sacawista flat nearly a mile distance on the other, both well-known landmarks. As we rode out and approached the location, we dropped a man every half mile until the hill and adjoining salt flat had been surrounded. We had divided what rifles the ranch owned between the two squads, so that each side of the circle was armed with four guns. I had a carbine and had been stationed about midway on the leeward half circle. At first sign of dawn, the signal agreed upon, a turkey call, sounded back down the line, and we advance. The circle was fully two miles in diameter, and on receiving the signal, I rode slowly forward, halting at every sound. It was a cloudy morning, and dawn came late for clear vision. Several times I dismounted, and in approaching objects at a distance, drove my horse before me, only to find that as light increased, I was mistaken. When both the flat and the dagger-crowned hill came into view, not a living object was in sight. I had made the calculation that, had the Manada grazed during the night, we should be far to the leeward of the band, for it was reasonable to expect that they would feed against the wind. But there was also the possibility that the outlaw might have herded the band several miles distant during the night and while I was meditating on this theory, a shot rang out about a mile distant and behind the hill. Giving my horse the rowl, I rode in the direction of the report, but before I reached the hill, the manada tore around it, almost running into me. The coyote mustang was leading the band, but as I halted for a shot, he turned inward, and the mares intervening cut off my opportunity. But the warning shot had reached every rider on the circle, and as I plied rowl and quirk to turn the band, Tio Trebusio cut in before me and headed them backward. As the band whirled away from us, the stallion forged to the front, and by biting and a free use of his heels, attempted to turn the manada on their former course. But it mattered little which way they turned now, for our cordon was closing round them the windward line, then being less than a mile distant. As the band struck the eastward or windward line of horsemen, the mares, except for the control of the stallion, would have yielded, but now, under his leadership, they recoiled like a band of ladinos. 
but every time they approached the line of the closing circle they were checked, and as the cordon closed to less than a half mile in diameter, in spite of the outlaw's lashings, the manada quieted down and halted. Then we unslung our carbines and rifles and slowly closed in upon the quarry. Several times the Mustang Stallion came to the outskirts of the band, uttering a single piercing snort, but never exposing himself for a shot. Little by little, as we edged in, he grew impatient, and finally trotted out boldly, as if determined to forsake his harem, and rush the line. But the moment he cleared the band, Uncle Lance dismounted, and as he knelt, the stallion stopped like a statue, gave a single challenging snort, which was answered by a rifle report, and he fell in his tracks. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shadows. Spring was now at hand after an unusually mild winter. With the breaking of the drought of the summer before, there had sprung up all through the Encinal and sandy lands an immense crop of weeds called by the natives Margosa, fallow weed. This plant had thriven all winter, and the cattle had forsaken the best mesquite grazing in the river bottoms to forage on it. The results showed that their instincts were true, for with very rare exceptions, every beef on the ranch was fit for the butcher's block. Truly, it was a year of fatness succeeding a lean one. Never during my acquaintance with Las Palomas had I seen the cattle come through a winter in such splendid condition. But now there was no market. Faint rumors reached us of trail herds being put up in nearby counties, and it was known that several large ranches in Nueces County were going to try the experiment of sending their own cattle up the trail. Lack of demand was discouraging to most ranchmen, and our range was glutted with heavy steer cattle. The first spring work of any importance was gathering the horses to fill a contract we had with Captain Byler. Previous to the herd which Deweese had sold and delivered at Fort Worth the year before, our horse stock had amounted to about 4,000 head. With the present sale, the ranch holdings would be much reduced, and it was our intention to retain all manadas used in the breeding of mules. When we commenced gathering, we worked over every one of our sixty-odd bands, cutting out all the fillies and barren mares. In disposing of whole manadas, we kept only the geldings and yearlings, throwing in the old stallions for good measure, as they would be worthless to us when separated from their harems. In less than a week's time, we had made up the herd, and as they were all in the straight horse-hoof, we did not road-brand them. While gathering them, we put them under day and night herd, throwing in five remudas, as we had agreed, but keeping back the bell mares, as they were gentle and would be useful in forming new bands of saddle horses. The day before the appointed time for the delivery, the drover brought up saddle horses and enough picked mares to make his herd number fifteen hundred. The only unpleasant episode of the sale was a difference between Theodore Quayle and my employer. Quayle had cultivated the friendship of the drover until the latter had partially promised him a job with the herd in case there was no objection. But when Uncle Lance learned that Theodore expected to accompany the horses, he took Captain Frank to task for attempting to entice away his men. The drover entered a strong disclaimer maintaining that he had promised Quayle a place only in case it was satisfactory to all concerned. Further, that in trail work with horses he preferred Mexican vaqueros, and had only made the conditional promise as a favor to the young man. Uncle Lance accepted the explanation and apologized to the drover, but fell on Theodore Quayle, and cruelly unbraided him for forsaking the ranch without cause or reason. 
Theodore was speechless with humiliation. But no sooner were the hasty words spoken than my employer saw that he had grievously hurt another's feelings and humbly craved Quayle's pardon. The incident passed and was apparently forgotten. The herd started north on the trail on the 25th of March. Quayle stayed on at Las Palomas, and we resumed our regular spring work on the ranch. While gathering the mares and fillies, we had cut out all the geldings four years old and upward to the number of nearly two hundred. And now our usual routine of horse-breaking commenced. The Masons had completed their work on all three of the cottages and returned to the mission, but the carpenter yet remained to finish up the woodwork. Fidel and Juana had begun housekeeping in their little home, and the cozy warmth which radiated from it made me impatient to see my cottage finished. Through the mistress arrangements had been made for the front rooms in both John's cottage and mine to be floored instead of cemented. Some two weeks before Easter Sunday, Cotton returned from the Frio, where he had been making a call on his intended. Uncle Lance at once questioned him to know if they had set the day and was informed that the marriage would occur within ten days after Lent, and that he expected first to make a hurried trip to San Antonio for a wedding gift. "'That's all right, John,' said the old ranchero approvingly, "'and I expect Quirk might as well go with you. You can both draw every cent do you and take your time, as wages will go right on the same as if you were working. There will not be much to do except the usual horse-breaking and a little repairing about the ranch. It's quite likely I shan't be able to spare Tom in the early summer, for if no cattle buyer comes along soon, I'm going to send June to the coast and let him sniff around for one. I'd like the best in the world to sell about three thousand beeves, and we never had fatter ones than we have today. If we can make a sale, it'll keep us busy all the four part of the summer. So both of you fellows knock off any day you want to and go up to the city, and go horseback, for this ranch don't give Bethel and Oxenford stages any more of its money. With this encouragement, we decided to start for the city the next morning, but that evening I concluded to give a certain roan gelding a final ride before turning him over to the vaqueros. He was a vicious rascal, and after trying a hundred maneuvers to unhorse me, reared and fell backward, and before I could free my foot from the stirrup, caught my left ankle, fracturing several of the small bones in the joint. That settled my going anywhere on horseback for a month, as the next morning I could not touch my foot to the ground. John did not like to go alone, and the mistress insisted that Theodore was well entitled to a vacation. The master consented, each was paid the wages due him, and catching up their own private horses, the old cronies started off to San Antonio. They expected to make Mr. Booth's ranch in a little over half a day, and from there a sixty-mile ride would put them in the city. After the departure of the boys, the dull routine of ranch work went heavily forward. The horse-breaking continued, vaqueros rode the range, looking after the calf crop, while I had to content myself with nursing a crippled foot and hobbling about on crutches. Had I been able to ride a horse, it was quite possible that a ranch on the San Miguel would have had me as its guest, and I must needs content myself with lying around the house, visiting with Juana, or watching the carpenters finishing the cottages. I tried several times to interest my mistress in a scheme to invite my sweetheart over for a week or two, but she put me off on one pretext and another, until I was vexed at her lack of enthusiasm. But truth compels me to do the good woman justice, and I am now satisfied that my vexation was due to my own peevishness over my condition and not to neglect on her part. And just then she was taking such an absorbing interest in June and the widow, and likewise so sisterly a concern for Dan Happersat, that it was little wonder 
she could give me no special attention when I was soon to be married. It was the bird in the bush that charmed Miss Jean. Toward the close of March a number of showers fell, and we had a week of damp, cloudy weather. This was unfortunate. As it called nearly every man from the horse-breaking to ride the range and look after the young calves. One of the worst enemies of a newly born calf is screw worms, which flourish in wet weather and prove fatal unless removed, for no young calf withstands the pest over a few days. Clear, dry weather was the best preventative against screw worms. But until the present damp spell abated, every man in the ranch was in the saddle from sunrise to sunset. In the midst of this emergency work, a beef buyer by the name of Wayne Orahood reached the ranch. He was representing the leasees of a steamship company plying between New Orleans and Texas coast points. The merchant at the ferry had advised Orahood to visit Las Palomas, but on his arrival about noon, there was not a white man on the ranch to show him the cattle. I knew the anxiety of my employer to dispose of his mature beefs, and as the buyer was impatient, there was nothing to do but get up horses and ride the range with him. Miss Jean was anxious to have the stock shown, and in spite of my lameness, I ordered saddle horses for both of us. Unable to wear a boot and still hobbling on crutches, I managed to Indian mount an old horse, my left foot still too inflamed to rest in the stirrup. From the ranch we rode for the Encinal ridges and sandy lanes to the southeast, where the fallow weed still throve in rank profusion, and where our heaviest steers were liable to range. By riding far from the watering points, we encountered the older cattle, and within an hour after leaving the ranch, I was showing some of the largest beeves on Las Palomas. How that beef buyer did ride! Scarcely giving the cattle a passing look, he kept me leading the way from place to place where our saleable stock was to be encountered. Avoiding the ranchitos and wells, where the cows and younger cattle were to be found, we circled the extreme outskirts of our range, only occasionally halting, and then, but for a single glance over some prime beeves. We turned westward from the Encinal at a gallop passing about midway between Santa Maria and the home ranch. Then we pushed on for the hills around the head of the Ganso. Not once in the entire ride did we encounter anyone but a Mexican vaquero, and there was no relief for my foot in meeting him. Several times I had an inclination to ask Mr. Orahood to remember my sore ankle, and on striking the broken country I suggested we ride slower as many of our oldest beeves ranged through these hills. This suggestion enabled me to ease up and to show our best cattle to advantage until the sun set. We were then twenty-five miles from the ranch, but neither distance nor approaching darkness checked Wayne Orahood's enthusiasm. A dozen times, he remarked, we'll look at a few more cattle, son, and then ride in home. We did finally turn homeward, and at a leisurely gait, but not until it was too dark to see cattle, and it was several hours after darkness when we sighted the lamps at headquarters, and finished the last lap in our afternoon's sixty-mile ride. My employer and Mr. Orahood had met before, and greeted each other with a rugged cordiality, common among cowmen. The others had eaten their supper, but while the buyer and I satisfied the inner man, Uncle Lance sat with us at the table and sparred with Orahood in repartee, or asking regarding mutual friends, artfully avoiding any mention of cattle. But after we had finished, Mr. Orahood spoke of his mission, admitted deprecatingly that he had taken a little ride south and west that afternoon, and if it was not too much trouble, he would like to look over our beeves on the north of the Nueces in the morning. He showed no enthusiasm, but acknowledged that he was buying for shipment, and thought that another month's good grass ought to put our steers in fair condition. I noticed Uncle Lance clouding up 
over the buyer's lack of appreciation, but he controlled himself. And when Mr. Orahood expressed a wish to retire, my employer said to his guest, as with candle in hand the two stood in parting, "'Well now, Wayne, that's too bad about the cattle being so thin. I've been working my horse stock lately and didn't get any chance to ride the range until this wet spell. But since the screw worms got so bad, being short-handed, I had to get out and rustle myself, or we'd lost a lot of calves. Of course, I've noticed a steer now and then, and have been sorry to find them so spring poor. Actually, Wayne, if we were expecting company, we'd have to send to the ferry and get a piece of bacon, as I haven't seen a hoof to fit to kill. The roast beef which you had for supper, well, that was sent to us by a neighbor who has fat cows. About a year ago now, water was awful scarce with us, and a few old cows died up and down this valley. I suppose you didn't hear of it, living so far away. Heretofore, every time we had a drought, there was such a volunteer growth of fallow weed that the cattle got mud fat following every dry spell. Still, I'll show you a few cattle among the Wahia bush and sand hills on the divide in the morning and see what you think of them. But, of course, if they lack flesh, in case you are buying for shipment, I shan't expect you to bid on them. The old ranchero and the buyer rode away early the next morning and did not return until the middle of the afternoon, having agreed on a sale. I was asked to write and duplicate the terms and conditions. In substance, Las Palomas Ranch agreed to deliver at Rockport on the coast on the 20th of May, and for each of the following three months, 1,250 beeves, four-year-olds and upward. The consideration was $27.50 per head, payable on delivery. I knew my employer had oversold his holdings, but there would be no trouble in making up the 5,000 head, as all our neighbors would gladly turn in cattle to fill the contract. The buyer was working on commission, and the larger the quantity he could contract for, the better he was suited. After the agreement had been signed in duplicate, Mr. Orahood smilingly admitted that ours were the best beeves he had bought that spring. I knew it, said Uncle Lance. You don't suppose I've been ranching in this valley over forty years without knowing a fat steer when I see one? Tom, send a muchacho after a bundle of mint. Wayne, you haven't got a lick of sense in riding. I'm as tired as a dog. The buyer returned to Shepherd's the next morning. The horse-breaking was almost completed, except allotting them into remudas, assigning bell mares, and putting each band under herd for a week or ten days. The weather was faring off, relieving the strain of riding the range, and the ranch once more relaxed into its languid existence. By a peculiar coincidence, Easter Sunday occurred on April the 13th that year it being also the sixty-sixth birthday of the ranchero. Miss Jean usually gave a little home dinner on her brother's birthday, and had planned for one this occasion, which was but a few days distant. In the mail, which had been sent for on Saturday before Easter, a letter had come from John Cotton to his employer, saying that he would start home in a few days, and one that Father Norquin sent for, as the wedding would take place on the 19th of the month. He also mentioned the fact that Theodore expected to spend a day or two with the Booths returning, but he would ride directly down to the Vaux ranch, and possibly the two would reach home about the same time. I doubt if Uncle Lance ever enjoyed a happier birthday than this one. There was every reason why he should enjoy it. For a man of his age, his years rested lightly. The ranch had never been more prosperous. Even the drought of the year before had not proved an ill wind, for the damage then sustained had been made up by conditions resulting in one of the largest sales of cattle in the history of the ranch. A chapel and three new cottages had been built without loss of time and at very little expense. A number of children had been born to the soil, while the natives were as loyal to their master as subjects in the days of feudalism. 
There was but one thing lacking to fill the cup to overflowing. The ranchero was childless. Possessed with a love of the land so deep as to be almost his religion, he felt the need of an heir. "'Birthdays to a band of my years,' said Uncle Lance, over Easter dinner, are food for reflection. When one nears the limit of his allotted days and looks back over his career, there is little that satisfies. Financial success is a poor equivalent for other things. But here I am preaching when I ought to be rejoicing. Someone get John's letter and read it again. Let's see. The 19th falls on Saturday. Lucky day for Las Palomas. Well, we'll have the Padre here, and if he says barbecue of beef, down goes the fattest one on the ranch. This is the year in which we expect to press our luck. I begin to feel it in my old bones that the turning point has come. When Father Norquin arrives, I think I'll have him preach us a sermon on the evils of single life. But then it's hardly necessary, for most of you boys have got your eye on some girl right now. Well, hasten the day, every rascal of you, and you'll find the cottage ready at a month's notice. The morning following Easter opened bright and clear while on every hand were the signs of spring. A vaquero was dispatched to the mission to summon the padre, carrying both a letter and the compliments of the ranch. Among the jobs outlined for the week was the repairing of a well, the walls of which had caved in, choking a valuable water supply with debris. This morning Deweese took a few men and went to the well to raise the piping and make the necessary repairs, curbing being the most important. But while the foreman and Santiago Ortez were standing on a temporary platform some thirty feet down, a sudden and unexpected cave-in occurred above them. Deweese saw the danger, called to his companion, and in a flash laid hold of a rope with which materials were being lowered. The foreman's warning to his companion reached the helpers above and Deweese was hastily windlassed to the surface. But the unfortunate vaquero was caught by the falling debris, he and the platform being carried down into the water beneath. The body of Ortiz was recovered late that evening. A coffin was made during the night, and the next morning the unfortunate man was laid in his narrow home. The accident threw a gloom over the ranch, yet no one dreamt that a second disaster was at hand. But the middle of the week passed without the return of either of the absent boys. Foul play began to be suspected, and meanwhile Father Norquin arrived, fully expecting to solemnize within a few days the marriage of one of the missing men. Aaron Scales was dispatched to the Vox Ranch and returned the next morning by daybreak with the information that neither quail nor cotton had been seen on the Frio recently. A vaquero was sent to the Booth Ranch, who brought back the intelligence that neither of the missing boys had been seen since they passed northward some two weeks before. Father Norquin, as deeply affected as any one, returned to the mission, unable to offer a word of consolation. Several days passed without tidings. As the days lengthened into a week, the master, as deeply mortified over the incident as if the two had been his own sons, let his suspicion fall on quail. And at last, when light was thrown on the mystery, the old ranchero's intuition proved correct. My injured foot improved slowly, and before I was able to resume my duties on the ranch, I rode over one day to the San Miguel for a short visit. Tony Hunter had been down to Oakville a few days before my arrival, and while there had met Clint Dansdale who was well acquainted with quail and cotton. Clint, it appeared, had been in San Antonio and met our missing men, and the three had spent a week in the city chumming together. As Dansdale was also on horseback, the trio had agreed to start home the same time, traveling in company until their ways separated. Cotton had told Dansdale what business had brought him to the city, and received the latter's congratulations. The boys had decided to leave for home on the ninth, and on the morning of the day set forth, moneyless, but rich in trinkets and toggery. 
but somewhere about forty miles south of San Antonio they met a trail herd of cattle from the Aransas River. Some trouble had occurred between the foreman and his men the day before, and that morning several of the latter had taken French leave. On meeting the travelers, the trail boss, being short-handed, had offered all three of them a berth. Quail had accepted without a question. The other two had stayed all night with the herd, Dansdale attempting to dissuade Cotton, and Quail, on the other hand, persuaded him to go with the cattle. In the end, Quail's persuasions won. Dansdale admitted that the opportunity appealed strongly to him, but he refused the trail foreman's blandishments and returned to his ranch, while the two Las Palomas lads accompanied the herd, neither one knowing or caring where they were going. When I returned home and reported this to my employer, he was visibly affected. So that explains all, said he, and my surmises regarding Theodore were correct. I have no particular right to charge him with ingratitude, and yet this ranch was as much his home as mine. He had the same to eat, drink, and wear as I had, with none of the concern, and yet he deserted me. I never spoke harshly to him but once, and now I wish I had let him go with Captain Byler. That would have saved me cotton and the present disgrace to Las Palomas. I ought to have known that a good honest boy like John would be putty in the hands of a fellow like Theodore. But it's just like a fool boy to throw away his chances in life. They still sell their birthright for a mess of pottage, and there stands the empty cottage to remind me that I have something to learn. Old as I am, my temper will sometimes get away from me. Tom, you are my next hope, and I'm almost afraid some unseen obstacle will arise as this one did. Does Francis know the facts? I answered that Hunter had kept the facts to himself, not even acquainting his own people with them, so that aside from myself, he was the first to know the particulars. After pacing the room for a time in meditation, Uncle Lance finally halted and asked me if Scales would be a capable messenger to carry the news to the Vox family. I admitted that he was the most tactful man on the ranch. Aaron was summoned given the particulars, and commanded to use the best diplomacy at his command in transmitting the facts, and to withhold nothing, to express to the ranchman and his family the deep humiliation everyone at Las Palomas felt over the actions of John Cotton. Years afterward I met Quail at a trail town in the north. In the limited time at our command, the old days we spent together in the Nueces Valley occupied most of our conversation. Unmentioned by me, his desertion of Las Palomas was introduced by himself, and in attempting to apologize for his actions, he said, Quirk, that was the only dirty act I was ever guilty of. I never want to meet the people the trick was practiced on. Leaving Las Palomas was as much my privilege as going there was, but I was unfortunate enough to incur a few debts while living there that nothing but personal revenge could ever repay. Had it been any other man than Lance Lovelace, here I would have died the morning Captain Byler's horse herd started from the Nueces River. But he was an old man, and my hand was held and my tongue was silent. You know the tricks of a certain girl who, with her foot on my neck, stretched forth a welcoming hand to a rival. Tom, I have lived to pay her my last obligation in a revenge so sweet that if I die an outcast on the roadside, all accounts are square. End of chapter 20